Okay. Science and humanism. You know, we often hear the charge that real scientists can't be creationists. Creationism is going to set science back to the dark ages. And they cite instances like the uh, flap between Galileo and the Roman Catholic Church, you know, over geocentrism, like, you know, the idea that the uh, earth goes around the, the sun versus the uh, sun going around the earth and so forth, you know. Well, the thing is that ideas have consequences. Bad ideas have bad consequences, and that's what we're going to investigate tonight. The idea of evolution produces atheism. That is to say that evolution not only implies atheism, but it demands it. It implies that man is the solution to all of his own problems, that in effect, if evolution is true, then it leaves us with the only solution is ourselves. In this presentation, then, I'm going to contrast the bitter fruits of evolutionism with the positive results of belief in a creator. And here's what I'm going to talk about tonight. Science and humanism. How religious beliefs affect science in contrast with the negative effect of evolutionism on society and how research money is often wasted when based on evolutionary assumptions. And on the other hand, positive contributions of Christian scientists. So let's start off with religious beliefs. How do religious beliefs affect the development and the nature of science? Well, you know, the Greeks, the Chinese, the Indians, that is the Asian Indians, the Arabs, all had a form of science, but eventually, not having a rigorous basis, it all uh, eventually fizzled out. But we in the Western world have had tremendous victories in science. Why is that? Well, I submit it's because we believe in a creator. Let's take a, take a look at some of the requirements. Well, first of all, we have to believe that time is linear, beginning with creation. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created. That's the first requirement. If we believe, like some cultures, that time is cyclical, that is to say it just goes round and round in circles, we end up back where we started, it tends to stifle scientific investigation because the tendency is, well, if we're just going to go around in a circle, we're going to end up back at the same place eventually. Why bother? Okay, another requirement is that we can't start with pseudoscientific assumptions like mythical accounts of creation. We need to have a rigorous basis to start off with. If we build on false assumptions, eventually our foundation is going to crumble. Also, we can't start off believing in pantheism. You know, pantheism is believing that God is everywhere. You're God, I'm God, the sky is God, the trees are God, and so forth. This kind of belief is endemic in... Um, New Age environmentalism, for instance, Hinduism, different places like that. But we have to see that God is separate from his creation. And we are creations of God. Okay, next, we have to believe that creation is orderly, purposeful, and predictable. If it's orderly and predictable, then we can study it, we can make predictions from our discoveries. Otherwise, if nature is subject to the malevolent whims of capricious gods, then why bother investigating? Like, if the scientific laws might be different from time to time or place to place, why bother investigating? <clears throat> Next, 
if we're going to study astronomy, we can't believe that the heavens are divine manifestations of the gods or something like this, or they're alive. Otherwise, again, it's not purposeful or orderly, so why bother trying to find out what the gods are going to do next? So there has to be, then, a reasonable balance between reason and faith. Um, we have to, we can't completely reject supernatural creation or the fact that generally God works through physical laws. And finally, we have to know that man is a unique creation made in God's image who's been given dominion over the earth. If we're not separate and distinct from the rest of nature, it tends to hinder investigation, such as is the case, for instance, with reincarnation. If our goal is just to be free from the endless repeating cycles of reincarnation and be one with the cosmic consciousness or something like this, it tends to stifle scientific inquiry. So let's just take a brief look at some of the other belief systems and why their science kind of fizzled out. Hinduism, for instance, they don't believe, or at least in the past, haven't believed that the, re the external world is real and orderly, so it tended to stifle their investigation. They believed in eternal cycles, and they believed that nature <clears throat> is living. All is God. In other words, pantheism. And finally, they believed in the divinity of the heavens. So it's difficult with those starting points to believe that there's any predictable order. It's dependent upon the fickleness of the gods. And likewise with Islam, um, <clears throat> they, the Quran puts God's will and his power above his will, or excuse me, above his reason. It's sort of a fatalistic viewpoint. I can't help but remember a story I heard about <clears throat> a guy who was drawing water downstream from a river, downstream of, of, from a guy who had just urinated in it. And somebody asked, well, why are you doing that? And the guy replies, well, everything is, is all as will. You know, if I get sick or not, it's all, all as will. Well, with a fatalistic viewpoint like that, how can you want to do anything if everything is just all as will? Now, the Arabs, the Arab world had started off with a, uh, quite a bit of science. They made advances in algebra, and uh, we still use the Arabic numeral system today. I sometimes stop and think, what if we had to do calculus using Roman num numerals, you know? Ah! So they started off making really good advances in mathematics, but it fizzled out with the advent of Islam. They uncritically adopted the Aristotelian viewpoint in many areas, like, um, <clears throat> the, like geocentrism, for instance, that the sun revolved about the earth and that the heavens were divine. Well, likewise with evolutionary humanism. What has that brought about? <clears throat> well, evolutionary humanism involves a number of unprovable assumptions. For example, uniformitarianism. Now, if you've been coming to Chris's seminars for very long, you're probably familiar with uniformitarianism, but if you're not, it's the assumption, the unprovable assumption, by the way, that everything, geologically speaking, has gone along at the same rate as today. For untold eons of time, everything has just progressed very, very slowly, and therefore, there was no Genesis flood. So, <clears throat> um, they have faith in unobservable, untestable, and unrepeatable past processes. And they might argue that, oh yeah, we can see evolution happening today in bacteria. Well, that might be called microevolution, and it's not really evolution. 
it's just adaptation. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but we don't see flies turning into horses or mice becoming something else, but bacteria remain bacteria, mice be remain mice, and so forth. <clears throat> In evolutionary humanism, materialism, and naturalism are only allowed. There's no room for a supernatural creator, no room for any kind of uh, divine intervention. I still remember the story of George W. Bush mentioning something about uh, intelligent design to some reporters one time, and they laughed and laughed at him. So that's the kind of intellectual climate we're in today. <clears throat> and so with this viewpoint then, man is just the result of random chance processes and not distinct from the rest of nature. So how long, with this viewpoint, will the science of today be what it is? How long will it be before Darwinism destroys the fundamentals of our science. It reminds me of Psalms 11, verse 3. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? In contrast, Christianity, I say, has a better foundation and has given our science a better foundation than any of the previous beliefs because we believe in a creator who created an orderly world capable of discovery. And if it's um, capable of discovery, predictions can be made. And in fact, the Bible predict or anticipated a number of discoveries. I think of, for instance, Matthew Morey, who founded the science of oceanography. There's a scripture that talks about the paths of the seas. He looked at that and says, paths of the seas, what does that mean? And that inspired him to investigate ocean currents, and that became the beginning of oceanography, which affects weather and actually um, <clears throat> inspired the science that gave me my degree, meteorology. <clears throat> And by the way, you've heard the, about the Puritans. Well, the Puritans are often mocked and scorned for being prudish, stuffy, strict, hypocritical, self-righteous, and all that stuff, which really they didn't deserve. But rather, it was the Puritan work ethic of diligence that paved the way for scientific inquiry. And prominent leaders of the Puritans be, they uh, founded the Royal Society, Britain's premier scientific organization. Well, so I say then that the advancement of science in Western civilization has been largely due to the Christian worldview. And in fact, during the so-called Dark Ages, science and technology actually did advance more slowly than today, but during that time, for instance, schools and universities were actually founded and learning was kept alive in the monasteries. And there were actually a number of inventions, which I don't have time to get into, but I say on the other hand, it's evolutionist, evolutionism that stifled free inquiry. And if you don't believe it, just ask somebody, some of the people who have lost their jobs by daring to mention creation on university campuses or in academia. In fact, questions that usually or sometimes have straightforward answers by taking the Bible literally are baffled, or evolutionists are baffled by. For example, the Ice Age directly follows from the Genesis flood. Evolutionists are still scratching their heads as to what could have caused the Ice Age, although they believe in multiple Ice Ages. Well, let's go on and talk about some of the results on societies by the belief in evolutionism. There are lots of them. 
Ideas have consequences. I'd like to start off with a quote from the Russian author Dostoevsky. He says, if there's no God, then everything is permissible. Everything is permissible because there's no absolute standard. The standards change from year to year. If there's no God, then who's to say what's right or wrong? Well, the ultimate authority then becomes man. And here in the United States, it's the nine people in black robes in Washington, D.C., I guess. <clears throat> One of the fallouts is social Darwinism. Social Darwinism is natural selection applied to society. And some of the results, <clears throat> or the way it's played out, I, I guess I should say, is the struggle for existence. <clears throat> In uh, biology, evolution is mutations acted upon by natural selection. Well, here, natural selection is applied to society, and you'll often see it phrased as the struggle for existence. You don't hear it as much today, but especially in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, you'd hear that Things like the races are biologically unequal and locked in a struggle for life and death. And that led to a lot of bloodshed. <clears throat> Here's a quote from Richard Weikard, or at least a paraphrase. He said, evolution progresses not through moral principles, but by the right of the stronger. You've heard the phrase, it's a jungle out there. Well, that's where this sort of thing comes from. Might makes right. Directly follows from evolution. How's that played out? Well, through all sorts of social evils. Now, I'm going to list a whole bunch of areas where evolution has run as sort of an undercurrent. Now, I'm not saying that evolution is responsible for all of these, but a lot of times it's been used as a justification for continuing on with them or as an impetus for um, moving them forward. I mean, after all, some of these things would have happened anyway. For instance, uh, Cain still would have killed Abel long before the myth of evolution was invented, so they still would have been there, but evolution is still used as an excuse for a lot of things. The church has been weakened by the doctrine of evolution. Uh, we've abandoned our traditional morality a lot of times. There's a, been a culture of death, racism, animal rights have been elevated. The outlook on life has been degraded a lot of times. We've lost our purpose, sense of direction. It's affected politics, ruthless business practices, and it's infected environmentalism. Let's take a look and see, for instance, how has evolutionism affected the church? <clears throat> well, we've abandoned, to a large extent, scripture as a final authority. When I say we, I'm talking about the church at large. No particular church in mind, but the church world around the world in general. <clears throat> Theistic evolution has replaced, in a lot of areas, biblical creationism. In other words, a lot of people have compromised with evolution. Well, they say, okay, I don't know what to believe. All those scientists out there are saying evolution is true, but we used to believe the Bible. Well, okay, what do I believe? Well, I, I guess we'll just believe both and somehow mer merge them together and call it good. But there's a problem because Jesus said he believed this literal six day um, creation. So, well, wait a minute. Then if Jesus was wrong, maybe he wasn't really God in the flesh 
manifest in the flesh. So if he wasn't God manifest in the flesh, then maybe he was just a highly evolved man ahead of his time, a good teacher maybe, but not our savior. So then what are we to make of him? Oh, well, I guess then we'll focus on something else like social justice rather than sin and our relationship with God. And so that led to liberation theology and a bunch of other stuff. And so we lay our foundational doctrines aside and do something else. And so a lot of churches then just become social clubs. And so why bother to go to church? We'll just stay home and watch TV. And so that's what's happened. In Great Britain, for instance, they have a commission on closing churches. That's all they do is close churches. And so I hear that only 5% of Britons go to church these days. So that's been largely due to evolutionism. I'm not saying that's the only thing, but there's been a problem there. So the result then has been an erosion of morality, moral relativism. And the thought there is if morality has evolved over time and it's always changing, then it becomes relative. It's my opinion versus yours. Who's to say who's right? Ultimately, those nine people in Washington, D.C., I guess. In fact, Charles Darwin actually stated that in his book, his autobiography, actually. He says, a man who has no assured and ever-present belief in the existence of a personal God or of a future existence with retribution and reward can have for his rule of life, as far as I can see, only to follow those impulses and instincts which are the strongest or which, is, which seem to him the best ones. In other words, what's right for me may not be right for you, but who's to judge? We just do our own thing. Does that remind you of anything in Scripture? Well, it reminds me of the book of Judges. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. And that's kind of where we are today in our society. So the result then, the new morality, although we've all almost gone past that now, almost any form of sex is okay. We're not quite to Sodom and Gomorrah yet, but I hope we never get there. So <clears throat> if Adam's in our past, God sets the rules, and there are absolutes. If an ape-like creature is in our past, then whoever sets the rules, or are there any rules? Nope, it's a jungle out there. Can all you get and get all you can, I guess. There's a quote from Michael Denton. It was because Darwinian theory broke man's link with God and set him adrift in a cosmos without purpose or end that its impact was so fundamental set him adrift without purpose or end that's evolution in action folks no purpose no meaning no end we just become fertilizer evolution produces a devaluation of life a culture of death. Have you ever seen these guys going around with a skull on their t-shirts? Every time I look at one of those I think death, a culture of death. But I like to think of John chapter 10 where Jesus says, I come to bring life and life more abundantly. I'd rather, rather think about that. But here's some of the th results of the culture of death. Aborth, abortion, euthanasia, eugenics. If you're not familiar with all those terms, I'm going to enlighten you. How did this come about? Well, you may have heard about a guy by the name of Ernst Haeckel. Haeckel was a professor of zoology at a German university in the late 19th century. He came up with a theory called embryonic recapitulation otherwise known as the gill slit theory. In this theory, 
he claimed that the human embryo has gill slits, a leftover remnant of evolution. And he published these drawings, which probably a number of you have seen. But in this top row here are the embryos of a number of different animals. And in the bottom row are the fetuses more fully developed. But these are the first stages. And right up here, you see those little folds. He claimed those were gill slits from the first or fish stage of evolution. Well, actually, they're not. They are pharyngeal folds that later develop into the, not, the jaw, the neck, the ears, and so forth. And not only that, but he faked his drawings. He faked them to make them look more alike, way more alike than they actually are. Well, during his lifetime, actually not too long after the first drawings were published, he was rebuked by his peers, but the drawings were just too good to let go by evolutionists. And they were published endlessly for over a hundred years, over and over again. Well, if you tell a lie long enough, people believe it. It becomes truth. In fact, even today, you may still see them in some biology textbooks. And <clears throat> so this is supposed to prove that the human embryo has evolved, that, that we evolved from amphibians. He called it the fundamental law of biology. And the slogan became, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, meaning that we went through all the lower stages of evolution during our development from the fetus through the baby. And uh, <clears throat> even though this has been disproven time and time again, still the myth persists. Well, what's this got to do with anything? It leads directly to abortion, even though you may not hear about it on too much. It gives justification for abortion because the fetus, they say, isn't fully human yet. There's no problem in having it aborted because it's just a blob of tissue, and so getting rid of it is not a problem. It's not a baby yet. It's just in the lower stages of evolutionary development. And <clears throat> One person who took advantage of this was Margaret Sanger. She has been hailed as a great humanitarian, but she, she was the um, founder of Planned Parenthood, and she said that birth control was nothing more or less than the facilitation of weeding out of the unfit. In other words, she was an admirer of Darwin, as was Heckel. In fact, Heckel himself promoted infanticide in a book he wrote, wrote called The Natural History of Creation. So Sanger helped, um, she wanted to help the evolutionary process of man and proposed to help the process of survival of the fittest by birth control. Well, the recent expose of Planned Parenthood selling baby parts Showing that shows that their philosophy has not changed since the days of Margaret Sanger. Well, then there's euthanasia. Euthanasia literally means easy death, sometimes called mercy killing. Today we have the next best thing, or worst thing, as you might want to call it, physician-assisted suicide being promoted as death with dignity. It's now legal in five states, including Washington State, and euthanasia and or physician-assisted suicide is legal in eight countries outside of the United States. It was heavily promoted by Dr. Death himself, Jack Kevorkian, who died in 2011. He was sentenced to 10 to 25 years in prison for second degree homicide. He served eight of those years before he was let out. 
He claimed to have assisted 130 people in suicide. Now, it's been justified, that is, helping people to die, on the grounds of moral relativism. relativism. What's right for me is my choice, according to him. Well, the subtle undertone here is helping the evolutionary process by not burdening the fittest by wasting our resources on those who can't contribute to anything to society. I mean, after all, animals don't care for the sick or elderly, and we're just highly evolved animals, so why should we be any different? I mean, if a person isn't contributing anything to the good of humanity, then ending their lives is a benefit for society, right? Well, that's the reasoning that they use, but in other words, man is starting to play God here. And of course, you know, the rationale is, well, we want to be merciful. We want to end suffering. But of course, there have already been abuses reported, especially in Europe, getting people, getting rid of people who are in the way. And then there is, oh yeah, survival of the fittest. Then there's eugenics. Eugenics was popular mainly in the 1930s, um, but it comes directly from Darwin. It's the self-direction of human evolution by means of selective breeding. Did you know that Darwin was a racist? People don't usually like to admit that today, but this is from the first page of his book on the origin of species. The subtitle is The Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Now, who is the favored race? Well, Western European Caucasians, of course. They viewed the lowest, least evolved race to be the Tasmanian Aborigines. I'll come back to them a little bit later. But evolution views death as a good and necessary process. And so here's a quote again from Charles Darwin. Thus, from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of the higher animals, directly follows from famine and death, Wow. So eugenics then is an offshoot of Darwinism, supposedly helping the evolutionary process by eliminating the unfit members of society, the poor, the elderly, the infirm, mentally retarded, and so-called inferior races in order to breed a superior human race. I think some of you can see where that's going. The word eugenics was actually coined by Darwin's cousin and admirer, Francis Galton, in 1883. Galton said that his goal was to improve the human race by giving the more suitable races or st strains of blood, of blood a better chance of prevailing speedily over the less suitable Evolutionary biologists of the late 19th and 20th centuries worried that society was destroying itself by preventing natural selection from eliminating the poor, sick, handicapped, and inferior races. Boy, if anything goes against what the Bible teaches, that's got to be it. Well, the eugenics movement peaked in America in the, in the 1930s. In all, some 63,000 people were forcibly sterilized. Margaret Sanger was part of the eugenics, oops, let's see, is that it? Yeah, part of the eugenics movement. Um, she warned of the dangers inherent in the very idea 
of humanitarianism and altruism, dangers which have today produced their full harvest of human waste. And she went on to brand, brand a feeble-minded a menace to the race and compared them to weeds. And so she said, death hastens evolution. <clears throat> well, today, especially after the Holocaust, most evolutionists distance themselves from eugenics, saying that it distorted evolution. As I mentioned, Darwin was a racist. And so I bring up the sad story of Oda Benga. In the latter part of the 19th and early 20th centuries, it was commonly believed that the different races occupied different rungs on the evolutionary ladder. In 1906, there was a Congolese pygmy by the name of Oda Benga, who was believed to be a missing link on this evolutionary ladder. He was captured and put on display in the Bronx Zoo in New York. He was put on display next to an orangutan. And <clears throat> a couple of evolutionists took and made him look more prim primitive than he was. If you look closely, look at his teeth. You see how pointy they are? They filed him down to make him look more primitive. Well, he was on display as a missing link for some time before a couple of African-American clergymen protested and had him released, not on the grounds of racism, but on the grounds that it promoted evolution. Well, Oda Benga could never quite adjust to Western society, and he eventually committed suicide. But that was just one example. During that same period of history, there were a number of displays of so-called missing links. Um, <clears throat> there was one called uh, a Parade of Evolutionary Progress at the 1904, uh, excuse me, 1904 St. World, St. Louis World's Fair that displayed 2,000 so-called primitives, pygmies from New Guinea and Africa, uh, New Guinea and Africa. They were put on display in the primate section of the world of the Bronx Zoo. This poster was from the People's Show in Stuttgart, 1928. H.G. Wells, you may recognize that name. He wrote The War of the Worlds. He aligned himself with the eugenics movement, and he wrote, there's only one sane and logical thing to be done with a really inferior race, and that is to exterminate it. And then I come to the story of the Ta Tasmanian Aborigines, a really dark chapter in racism. The British had been systematically exterminated by... <laughs> The Tasmanians had been systematically exterminated by the British for many years, using Darwinism as an excuse. Now, they had been doing this before Darwin's book came out, but after it came out, they stepped up their efforts using Darwinism as an excuse. And finally, the last one died out in the 1870s. As they began to die out, evolutionists, started digging up their bodies and putting them on display in museums as evidence of missing links. And finally, when the last one died, they dug the body up and put it on display as well. Um, <clears throat> they were probably a result of actual cultural de-evolution. They had lost the art of making clothing. They had given up catching fish, living on crabs and shellfish for the most part. 
and they had lost the art of making fire. They had started depending on borrowing fire from their neighbors or having to keep a fire going. But Darwinism gave the British an excuse for exterminating them. <clears throat> How about animal rights and evolution? Well, going back to a quote from Charles Darwin, he says, there's no fundamental difference between man and the higher mammals in their mental faculties. The difference in mind between man and the higher mammal animals, great as it is, certainly is one of degree and not of kind. This is from his book, The Descent of Man. So if we're not created in the image of God, then we don't have any special status. We're just a little higher on the evolutionary ladder. Then, if that's true, then animals should have many of the same rights that humans enjoy, especially those animals deemed to be closest to humans, like apes and chimps. So we have animal rights activists saying that apes and chimps and so forth should have legal personhood. They should have the same legal pr protections as those given to children and others that can't speak for themselves. They should have lawsuits filed on their behalf. They should have compensatory damages for medical expenses. They should have provision for a comfortable retirement and constitutional rights such as the Eighth Amendment prohibiting cruel and unusual punishment, the Thirteenth Amendment prohibiting slavery. Well, my wife and I raised guide dog puppies for the blind, and the people who run guide dogs for the blind are telling us because of animal rights activists, they may be able to only train guide dogs for another 15 years if things keep progressing the way they are because the, these activists are pushing for laws that would prohibit the use of uh, service animals. In other words, slaves. We are making these dogs obey us as slave dogs. We can't do that. Well, I guess maybe they'd rather have them run wild in the streets. I don't know. So that's the way things are going. Animal rights activist Stephen M. Wise celebrates 19th century atheism and scientism, which he believes proved that the universe was not designed at all, much less designed for humans. Okay. What about the outlook on life? If the universe is without design or purpose, man's an accident in space, or we aren't anything unique. And then, if we aren't anything unique, anything special, if we came from nowhere, we're going nowhere, then what's the use? What's there to live for? Life has no meaning. Maybe then evolution becomes a sort of substitute religion. People looking for some meaning in life then turn to drugs and alcohol and whatever. <clears throat> and it, for some people, it, it's whatever. It turns out that they can find an excuse for doing almost anything. It's not my fault. I inherited it because of evolution. We're not responsible for what we, whatever happens. Homosexuality, they've been trying to find the homosexual gene and blame it on somebody else, but they haven't succeeded yet. And you've probably seen these TV ads that say, well, alcohol's not your fault, it's a disease, you inherited it, or whatever. Crime can be blamed on evolution. Violence, then, is natural to man, a product of evolution, according to one guy. We inherited it. 
It's might makes right. Anyway, it's a jungle. It's not your fault. How about politics? Did you know that the 20th century was the bloodiest century in human history? Some 200 to 300 million people died because of the three big isms, communism, Nazism, fascism, and they all have an undercurrent of evolution, among other things, but we're concentrating on evolution. They all believed in one form or another of evolution. Nazism, Mein Kampf, my struggle, going back to the struggle for existence inherent in natural selection or evolution, and superior superiority of the Aryan race, fascism, violence, struggle, communism and Marxism, going back to the class struggle, again, <clears throat> the acting out of the struggle for existence. How about in business? The struggle for existence played out in the business world. Here's a quote by John D. Rockefeller. This, that is the use of ruthless business tactics, is not an evil tendency in business. It's merely the working out of a law of nature and a law of God. You see, he equated evolution and the struggle that it entails as a law of God, and therefore it gave him an excuse to amass millions at the expense of others and exploit labor. How about environmentalism? Well, if God isn't the creator, then Earth is a product of evolution, and we owe our allegiance to Mother Earth. The, wor the worship of the environment, then, becomes sort of a substitute religion, which is really a form of pantheism. It's, this is a hallmark of the New Age movement. In fact, all forms of New Age pantheism are based on evolution. Maybe you've heard of the nature's rights movement. It seeks to grant the same rights to flora and fauna that humans have had. There's a thing called the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother Nature. It announces that the rights of nature are inalienable, without distinction of any kind, such as may be made between organic and inorganic beings, origin, use to human beings, or any other state. You see what they're saying there? That tree out there has the same rights as you and I do. The dog running down the street, no different. The chimpanzee in the jungles of Africa, we're all the same. We all have the same rights. There's no distinction at all. We're not made in the image of God. <clears throat> and then there's the so-called Gaia hypothesis. Gaia was the name of an ancient earth goddess. So the Gaia hypothesis says that the earth and its ecosystems are part of a living entity from which we have sprung. Since we both evolved from dark stardust, 